Welcome to the webcast, The Emerging Role of Dry Gluten Stands for the Treatment of Complex Coronary Lesions. This program is provided by North American Center for Continuing Medical Education, LLC, and is supported by an educational grant from Cordis Cardinal Health Company. I'm Philippe Genereux. I'm an interventional cardiologist working at Marston Medical Center in New Jersey, in Montreal, Canada, Hospital de Secretaire de Montreal, and also in Cardiovascular Research Foundation. And I will be your presenter today. Here are my disclosure. So today the goal of my uh, brief presentation will be mainly to highlight the emergence of actually new drug looking stem technology, especially, uh, especially in, in light of a bare metal stem in parallel with bare metal stem technology, and also to highlight the new uh, use of these DES, especially in very difficult to treat population, such as complex PCI lesion or older patients. I will also uh, touch base on novel DES technology that has been recently approved by the FDA. First, I wanted to talk about a recent trial that has been presented at TCT 2017 this year and has been also published in Lancet. It's the senior trial, which was a very interesting trial comparing the bioabsorbable polymer-based metallic DES, the Synergy stent, compared to bare metal stent, and especially in light of a short DAP one month uh, in patients with uh, complex coronary artery disease, older than 75 years old, a very common and growing population. So the objective of this study actually was to really evaluate the outcome of a very thin strap, synergy stent, um, a novel drug gluten stent compared to a bare metal stent in the very elderly patient treated with short DAP, especially in light of their eye prevalence of bleeding during their follow-up. The hypothesis of this um, of this trial was that DES have a lower rate of MACE at one year compared to BMS. They have similar risk of bleeding at one year, and they have a similar risk of stent thrombosis at one year. Senior trial design is presented here. Actually, was a randomized trial well performed one for one in a very single blind trial with 1,200 patients, age of 75 years old and above. Um, he compared tailored DAP one month in stable patient and six months in ACS patient. Compare DES synergy compared to bare metal stand, and the primary endpoint was at one year with composite endpoint of all cause mortality, non fatal MI, stroke, and ischemic driven target lesion or vascularization. They also explore actually a secondary endpoint at one year, which was the bleeding defined as a bar classification. 2 to 5 or 3 to 5, and stent thrombosis. So this is the drug eluting stent, the Synergy uh, drug eluting stent used in the senior trial. It's a very thin 74 micron uh, stent um, covered with Eberonimus and with a PLGA polymer. So it's com com compared to bare metal stent. Key inclusion criteria were the patient uh, being above 75 years old uh, with the presence of one feature, uh, at least one or more lesion of 70% in um, a vessel or less may more than 60%, and having symptoms of either stable angina, silent ischemia, or acute coronary syndrome. The key exclusion criteria obviously were the uh, incapacity to comply with that at least for one month or in six months respectively in stable angina or ACS. Plan surgery uh, within a month. Life expectancy was less than one year prior stroke, uh, especially hemorrhagic, hemorrhagic stroke. Uh, indication for surgical vascularization and no allergy to a, either aspirin or any PTY12 inhibitor. So the senior trial design enrolled actually 1,200 patients. Um, Actually, one month that was intended in 57 patients for stable patients, and six months was 43%. 596 patients were randomized in DES compared to 604 in the BMS. And actually, the MACE at one year were assessed in 
1,176 patients. 98% fill up at one year, which is extremely good. The baseline characteristic, I like very old patient, obviously, uh, around 81 years old, well balanced, um, with actually 26% roughly of diabetic patient, uh, roughly 18% and 13% of uh, previous MI patient, EVD patient 14 and 21%, and AFib patient in 17 to 18% roughly in both groups. A very sick patient, um, very all comers patient. This was the distribution of the population, drug losing stem, uh, and, and BMS have a similar distribution between stable angina and silent ischemia, which is roughly 30% of the patients. And then STEMI and STEMI and non stable angina complete the pie with 70% of the patients. And geographically speaking, it was a rather complex patient with 30, uh, roughly 30% 30 of the patient having multivessel disease with 3.9% um, and 1.3% respectively of, of left main lesion in DS and BMS, and uh, half of the patient had the LED lesion. It was a, a mean actually of 1.7 and 1.6 stent implanted, um, and the total stent length per patient was roughly 30 millimeter of stent. Interesting, very interesting here, the DAB duration between both groups. Um, as you can see, 50% uh, of the patient uh, roughly uh, discontinued DAB um, at one month. Uh, and as you can see here, uh, at six months, approximately 20% of the patient were on DAB at six months, meaning that a lot of patients stopped DAB between one and six months. The primary endpoint, actually, the, uh, was, which was the all-cause mortality, MI stroke, and uh, TLR, uh, was actually achieving 16.4% of the BMS population compared to 11.6% of the DES population, the synergy stand, and very highly significant with a P of 0, uh, 0.016, uh, with um, an NNT of 21. This is very important, showing actually the uh, efficacy of uh, DES over BMS in this very sick population um, with mainly driven by uh, TLR, which is not surprising. When we look at the MACE, the component of, uh, in this study, actually, as you can see, there's no difference in mortality compared to DES and BMS. However, there is a numerically higher rate of mortality at one year with, uh, with BMS. When you look actually uh, at the TLR, 6% for BMS compared to 1.7% with the synergy stent, which actually is, super, is very important and really underline actually that this stent, um, the synergy is, very, is associated with the ischemic driven TLR very low, 1.7%, uh, leading to actually a MACE rate in the interior for uh, drug looping stent, like we said uh, before. From a safety endpoint point of view, as you can see here, the bleeding um, defined actually as bark scale 2 to 5, 3 to 5, were very similar compared to the both group, and BMS and DES. The most, one of the most important findings actually is the stent thrombosis rate were not different between groups. Actually, we had a strong trend showing actually almost three-fold decrease of stent thrombosis with dragolutin stent compared to bare metal stent with a very short uh, DAP regimen. So this is a very important finding. Drug eluting stent are very safe uh, in patients with short DAP, especially all patients at risk of bleeding. So I think it's an, probably the most important finding of uh, this study. When you look at the net clinical benefits, when we pair MACE uh, endpoint to bleeding endpoint, you still see the superiority of uh, synergy stent, the drug eluting stent, compared to bare metal stent with 14.4% of a net clinical benefit endpoint compared to 19.2 for BMS, highly significant uh, for uh, these endpoints. When we look at the subgroup analysis, actually, uh, we saw actually that BES were potentially better for a uh, younger uh, patient, less than 85, so between 75 and 85, and with patient with no AFib. Um, so extremely important finding, but 
DES will pro probably sphere out across all the group um, with uh, no strong interaction globally. And in summary, the senior trial is very important because that shows for the first time that bioabsorbable uh, polymer DES synergy compared to BMS uh, in all patients treated with short depth showed a lower MACE compared to bare metal stem, um, show a lower TLR, which is not surprising, uh, but also very safe, no difference in bleeding, and actually a lower a trend to a lower stent thrombosis. So I believe this study is very important in practice because really I like that in all population where we want and tend to use shorter DAP, the synergy stent um, is very safe and probably should be preferred option uh, compared to bare metal stent. And this study actually really confirmed that potentially that the role of bare metal stents should be minimized or maybe eliminate for the practice, given that we have very safe platforms such, such as Synergy um, in old patients. And these uh, findings have been recently published uh, in Lancet Journal, and congratulations to the trial uh, investigator. Now I want to, to discuss a brand new platform that just has been uh, approved by the FDA for use in the United States, um, is the Illinier Rhydopharolaminous uh, Illusine Stent, um, and namely the Bionics and the Nearest, which are both study has been published and presented. So the Illinier system is a brand new uh, system, actually using a unique way to manufacturing the stent, which is very efficient and give high quality. Um, the platform is an 80 micron cobalt chromium. The drug is uh, Rhydophorolimus, um, and actually um, that's allowed, the, the, the way to manufacture the stent allows for a very uniform dosing of the drug, as you can see on the right, um, compared to regular DES, the binary stent is very give a very uniform dosing and partition of the drug. And most importantly, um, that the elastomeric polymer remain intact plus elution, as you can see on these images on the bottom left. I think one of the most important key features of this new uh, drug eluding stent, beyond, the, beyond the, being very, very thin, is the spring tip, um, which allowed for more pushability uh, for lesion and being highly visible also when you cross difficult lesion and tortuous vessel. Here is the pharmacokinetic uh, of the drug. Uh, as you can see actually, um, by um, 120 days, 95.6 of the drug has been uh, released, which is um, compared to the regular drug. And one finding which is extremely important that has been reported in the nearest uh, study, which was a, their first study with a primary endpoint at six months of late loss in 302 patients, showed that the Illinier stent was non inferior to Resolute stent with an extremely low late loss of 0 0.04 and 0 0.03, which is very reassuring in these types of lesions. Um, and with no difference in six-month clinical endpoint, with an extremely low rate of target lesion failure for the Illinois stand of 1.5 compared to 3% for the Resolute. And when we look at these clinical endpoints at 12 months, we see that there's no difference compared to, the, to both groups, mainly uh, especially for mortality, for cardiac death, um, for TLR, TBR, but also uh, stem thrombosis. So very safe platform compared to uh, Resolute drug eluding stent. That's led to their um, not only all comers, but more comers trial called the Bionics trial, which involved very high risk population of patients, very all comers with almost no exclusion of patients with severe and symptomatic coronary disease, where CTO, SVG, multivessel disease, and non spinny were involved, were included in this trial. That was a trial that was performed in North America, Canada, United States, Europe, and Israel, 
um, and actually um, enrolled more than 19, 19 patients, 958 for the Illinois stent and 961 for the Resolute stent, where um, the primary endpoint was a 12-month target lesion failure defined as a composite of cardiac death, target vessel remaining ischemia driven TLR, and a secondary endpoint uh, that was defined as a 12-month maze of CVF and all the individual components as uh, described above, and obviously definite probable stent thrombosis and procedural success. This is the population of this uh, trial <clears throat> showing actually that the linear uh, and the resolute are similar uh, population, very high proportion of diabetes patients, 33% roughly, um, with the age of 63, uh, 64 years old. ACS was very prevalent with 40% in both groups, roughly. Uh, no major significant uh, difference between the group. Prior cabbage was there in almost 10%, which is unknown, very known to be a high risk population. When we look at angiographic characteristic, importantly involved large surgery with the LAD involved in more than 40% of patients. Um, calcification was very present with more than almost 13% of the group with severe calcification, usually is more about 5 to 6%, showing a very high proportion of severe calcification in these patients. Um, Tortuous the, lesions were there in up to almost 10% of the patient, and bifurcation lesions were involved in 30% of the patient, which highlight how high risk and all comers these patients were. When we look at the angiographic characteristic, both group had similar uh, characteristic um, with complex lesion B2 and C being there in almost 60%, um, and with uh, almost a quarter of patients having um, overlapping stent. This is the procedural outcome. Actually, the lesion success and the procedure success were similar between both strategy. And device success were high in both. Uh, with 98% and 99.4%. When we look at the primary endpoint of target lesion failure at 12 months, clearly no difference uh, between both devices, between the linear stand and the resolute, with 5.4% with both devices, clearly meeting the non inferior uh, margin. This is another way to look at the primary endpoint of target lesion failure with capillary curve, which so at 12 months, no difference between both platforms. When we look at the key uh, endpoint result, as you can see, importantly, uh, the mortality was not different, the target lesion here was not different, and also the target vessel MI was not different. The very low rate of TLR of roughly between 2 and 3% between both stands with no significant difference. When we look at the uh, peri procedural MI or the uh, modified sky different definition of MI, you see that um, the linear stents meet the non inferiority uh, for all the different definitions of MI, either sky, modified sky, or universal definition. So a very safe platform compared to Resolute. Importantly, when we look at the rate of stent thrombosis, both platforms are extremely safe with 0 0.4 to 0.6% of stent thrombosis, 0.4% in inner platform, a little bit lower than Resolute. Um, and I think really showing how safe these new platforms are in a very extremely complex population. And what is important is that the uh, DAP adherence at 12 months was 75% for Bionier and 75% for Resolute, meaning that a quarter of patients stopped that before one year and especially in a very high risk population of uh, prior cabbage SVG, which is very impressive. This is the angiographic result and I just, uh, result. There is no difference in late loss in, stem, in, uh, in segment with a late loss um, of 0.22, which is extremely low, probably one of the lowest ever seen in this very complex population. And there is no difference in IVIS finding either. There is no interaction in the major subgroup between both, meaning that both then were uh, safe and non inferior. And I think, in conclusion, the linear clinical trial program, mainly with the Neers and Bionics, showed that we have a very low 
six months rate of incident late loss and very favorable outcome at 12 months. Uh, the new Bionic uh, and Elinear stand in the large trial showed that Elinear stand was non stereo to resolute for one year clinical outcome. It is very complex, uh, all comers, and we'll call it more comers population. They are identical target solution failure to one year. There is an extremely low rate of stent thrombosis of 0.4%. Uh, we no event beyond 30 days in the Elinear cohort which is very reassuring for this complex population. And the TLR results are very consistent between both study and late loss data are very reassuring. So these platform actually has been uh, FDA and C mark approved. And I think these data show that this new platform has a role, and especially with the spring tip and this deliverability platform is very encouraging for patients. So I think in conclusion, I will say that I believe that the DES technology um, of today, contemporary and, and future DES technology is very encouraging and clearly indicate that the role of bare metal stent because of the safety and the efficacy of the new DES platform, bare metal stent use is clearly, uh, should clearly be diminished and maybe abolished. We have now very safe platform, especially with the synergy and platforms such as the uh, Illinois stand that dual anti flaked therapy could be used uh, and be shortened six months for ACS and one month for stable. Um, so I think there's emerging data showing that short DAP could be used with multiple DES platform um, and more data will come in the near future. I think the field is very encouraging for this very complex patient, very old, high risk leading patient that we can use safe platform uh, such as Synergy, such as Illinear Stand, and with a very low rate of uh, ischemic endpoint and very, with a very short gap. So thank you for your attention and turning also to Dr. Pirik, my friend and colleague. Welcome to our webcast titled The Emerging Role of Drug Eluting Stents in the Treatment of Complex Coronary Lesions. My name is Manish Parikh. I'm an international cardiologist at the Columbia University Medical Center, and I will begin by presenting some of the background information on where we've been with respect to bare metal stenting and drug eluting stents. So what is our primary endpoint when we talk about uh, stenting technologies for clinical uh, uh, care. As PCI has evolved, so too has our understanding of drug eluting stent safety and efficacy. Clinical trials investigating stent performance have been designed to answer new questions as stent technology has improved. The current generation of stent design, polymer, and drug has resulted in a safety pro profile vastly improved from not only our bare metal stent, but first generation products. The question we'd like to dig into during this presentation is can we do better with our current technology, and if so, how? The evolution of drug looting uh, stent safety has been uh, one which has clearly been a roller coaster. First question we had was respect to efficacy, and we proved that early on with our first generation products that drug looting stents clearly reduced restenosis. Subsequent to that, in the 2005-2006 era, the question of safety arose with respect to not only very late stent thrombosis, but also late stent thrombosis, and a scare appeared with respect to its safety and respect to dual antiplatelet therapy and its duration. However, since the initial phase of drug loading stent usage, we have clearly, with newer generation products, increased our utility of these particular stents in very complex uh, patient subsets and com complex lesion subsets. And then the, really the question then becomes with respect to its efficacy and safety, even though markedly improved, can we do better? Should patients continue to have metallic drug loading stents 
should they have other stent product pipelines that are in in development, or should we be stenting at all? So what we learned early on from the first generation drug eluting stents are the problems created by very late stent thrombosis from the SCAR registry, which was a large number of patients, over 73,000 patients, looking at drug eluting stents versus bare metal stents with very good safety up until the one year point, but a divergence of stent thrombosis with a very high escalating yearly increment in the drug eluting stent patients versus the bare metal stent uh, patient population. We also saw, saw from the first generation DS products, late acquired stent malapposition, again, a harbinger for stent thrombosis. And the one thing that we noticed very early on after studying these patients two, three, four, and five years is a late catch-up phenomenon with late loss incremental over time and a restenosis rate that was cumulative over time that was theoretically and potentially a problem long-term. So what we did define after the first-generation products are stent benchmarks. We clearly reduced restenosis, but we were concerned about safety with respect to very late stent thrombosis and really were under the impression that bare metal stents potentially were safer. This was because of the first-generation products having thicker struts. Thick struts clearly had an increase in the foreign body, greater recirculation and stagnation of blood. And we also realized with these first-generation durable polymer products about the early concepts of non-uniform coatings, webbing and bonding, and delamination. And our thoughts from learning from this early era was that this was going to be an increased risk of stent thrombosis and restenosis, and this is what we were seeing clinically. Entered the second generation drug eluting stent products from 2007 and 8 and on, and clearly to date, the US, US market as of um, this particular year, 2017, has three products that are approved the Science or Chromium Cobalt Everolumis Eluting uh, uh, Stent, the uh, Platinum Chromium Everolumis Eluting Stent, and then also the Zotarolumis Eluting Stent called the Resolute. Uh, again, thin strut, um, variety of different polymer matrices very thin polymer thicknesses, durable polymer products, which were designed with the potential for improvement over our first generation products. And what did we find? What we clearly have learned, especially with the Limus products, especially with the Zions products, clear safety versus bare metal stent. Chromium cobalt everluminous eluding stent has shown to be significantly safer, safer than bare metal stenting in this network metal analysis containing nearly 50 randomized controlled trials. We look at 30-day, one-year, two-year data. Without a doubt, safety prevails over bare metal stenting. Quite impressive. In addition, there was a reduction in mortality. Uh, and actually, to date, the chromium cobalt ever luminous eluding stent science the only DES to have shown a mortality benefit over bare metal stenting. If you look at this data, looking at primary endpoint of cardiac death at two years and fatal myocardial infarction at two years, again, marked differences and, and lower rates that in the science versus the bare metal stent counterpart. The evolution of the DES technology has clearly brought us to the understanding that strut thickness matters, that there shouldn't be a trade-off for radial strength, and that thinner strut, strut, thinner strut stents prevail. As you can see on this particular slide, our evolution from first generation, now to second generation, and then also products that we're looking at, bioabsorbable polymer stents, which are not currently available in the United States, fully bioabsorbable scaffolds, with currently the absorbed stent product on hold, and 
a bioderivative polymer metallic protein scent with the Synergy scent currently that's available in the United States. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. Moving on, looking at uh, Zyans clearly shows consistent safety benefit over some of the other drug limiting stent platforms uh, and has really been a mainstay for many practitioners in the United States. The Resolute product also has shown very low definite and probable stent thrombosis. This is from the all comers Resolute data over 7,000 patients out five years with a 1.2 arc definite probable stent thrombosis rate extremely low. Expert CTO trial, which was run by David Kanzari, in a very complex situation with chronic total occlusions, again, a high safety profile with very low stent thrombosis rates in patients receiving the Zion's stent platform. Moving forward, if you look at complexity with respect to real-world patients, complex lesions, short three-month uh, do antiplatelet therapy. Um, the everolimus eluting stent, specifically the chromium cobalt version, has very, very low stent thrombosis rates out to three years. And as you increase in the complexity of the diabetic subset of patients, this in the Tuxedo trial, again, showing very low rates compared to the pachytaxel eluting stent out 24 months with very, very low PLRs as well in a very challenging, complex diabetic population. When you look at contemporary DES platforms, one does wonder whether the durable polymer, as it's, um, as it's constructed, plays a high rate of problem, creates significant problems for our patients over time. As such, the uh, Synergy stent, which is a biodural polymer-coated abluminal stent, thin strut, was constructed. And the, the theory here is that permanent polymers have been associated with inflammation, delayed healing, neoarthrosclerosis, and thrombosis risk following deployment. The, con the concept here is if a polymer is actually not durable and bioabsorbable, that potentially stent healing will improve and our clinical outcomes would also improve. Here's the construct of the current FDA-approved Synergy stent. It is the Everlumis drug with a luminal coating of 100 micrograms per centimeter squared, which is released over three months in a PLGA abluminal form with a 74 platinum chromium micron stent strut thickness. Early data suggests from the SCAR registry that clearly stent thrombosis rates seem to be lower um, in the first year over other drug eluting stent platforms. And no additional definite stent thrombosis was noted past six months with patients with synergy in this particular registry. As such, the Evolve Short Gap study is ongoing, looking at patients with high risk of bleeding, those over 75, those with long-term anticoagulation therapy, history of major bleeding, stroke or renal insufficiency, who potentially would be able to drop their dual antiplatelet therapy at three months and maintenance of aspirin alone. And we look forward to that data which is currently not yet available. However, we do have some early data looking at the PRISON-4 trial, looking at the bioabsorbable polymer DES, noted here in this particular slide of the Orsero product, which is another bioabsorbable polymer DES not currently available in the United States. But the conclusion here is with the durable polymer Zion stent in chronic total occlusions, there was a non-inferiority for in-segment late loss. The rate of binary restenosis was statistically significantly higher with the hybrid or zero stent, and the clinical outcomes were comparable between both stent groups, not really showing any advantage 
in this particular subset of patients over a biabsorbable polymer DES. The absolute annual event rates in randomized controlled trials looking at short DAPT versus prolonged DAPT shows that there is a slightly um, lower mortality, non-statistical, in the short DAPT over the prolonged. Clearly, higher bleeding rates in the prolonged uh, DAPT group with a lower myocardial infarction and stent thrombosis risk in the patients with prolonged DAPT. And this particular style, a tri, a slide shows the differences in stent thrombosis rates at the median rate per 1,000 patient years, being the lowest in the Everlumis Alluding Stent platform, looking at 76 randomized controlled trials with over 117,000 patient years of follow-up. So the short course DAPT compared with prolonged DAPT in a nutshell had a non-significant 0.2% lower rate of mortality, 0.5% lower rate of major hemorrhage, 0.5% higher rate of myocardial infarction, and a 0.3% higher rate of stent thrombosis. And at the present time, many practicing clinical interventionists in the cardiology community are really looking at safety and duration of new antiplatelet therapy for their patients because this is becoming more and more of a problem as patients require and have other comorbidities and require either discontinuation or interruption. So then the final question is, how do we improve upon our current technology? Are durable polymers, what we call durable polymers, polymers really, really durable? And does it really matter? Because the early data suggests whether it's bioabsorbable or durable, doesn't seem to really have a great difference. Well, the question of is it durable in this particular slide set, the following two uh, electron micrograph images were taken after these commercially available drug eluting stents were expanded to nominal diameter and immersed in plasma at 37 degrees Celsius for 50 days. And you have panel on the left and panel on the right. Both of these pictures show two particular current FDA-approved platforms. And my question to our audience is, can you guess which stent is coated with a durable polymer and which one is biodegradable? And many of us would have said the opposite of what we see here. The left-hand panel is actually the bioabsorbable or degradable, and the right-hand panel is what we call durable even though it looks so chewed up on the electron micrograph. So is it just one or the other? What we've found is that there's a dichotomous assignment of durable or degradable, and it's insufficient really to describe the reality of what actually happens when we implant these products in patients. The drug eluting stent has a construct which is complex and likely to represent an entire spectrum of durability, reflecting the material, the manufacturing process, the specific application, the life cycle of the product, and a complex interaction with the biology. What we find in these constructive drug looting stents is the degradation is related to three factors, mechanical factors, chemical and elution factors, and biological factors. And as interventionalists, we often don't think about this as we pull products off the shelf to implant in our patients. Here in this slide, you can see mechanical degradation. Pre-insertion with crimping, tracking along through the guide and down the vessel, and then subsequently with expansion. And you have three particular micrographs Two of the three are commercially available FDA-approved drug eluting stent products in the United States. One is one that is not currently available. But you see a marked degradation out after several weeks to months in these products. If you look at the chemical and elution properties, polymers degrade either pre-programmed or not 
at various rates. And drug elution affects the stability of the entire matrix. And in this particular um, slide, you have five panels, all images after nominal expansion at 50 days in plasma at 37 degrees Celsius. And you see the amount of webbing, cracking, delamination that occurs because of the chemical and elution properties in these particular quote unquote durable polymer stent products. And then the biological degradation is very difficult as you can imagine to image directly. It involves inflammation, it's affected by mechanical and the chemical degradation, and it's also affected by the presence and absence of drug. Here we introduce a soon to be uh, available and currently now finally FDA approved Elionir drug leading stent platform. Here this design assumption was that the extreme end of non-degrading spectrum may really offer clinical advantages, i.e. less inflammation, better endothelialization. This is a novel elastomeric polymer which reduces damage due to crimping, tracking, and expansion, and has a unique manufacturing process which promotes uniformity, adhesion, and surface quality, and nearly eliminates degradation due to chemical and elution. The whole premise is how could we currently improve what we have on the shelf? And this particular next generation stand platform attempts to do this in a durable polymer manufactured drug living stent. Here we see in this particular slide the Elionir drug living stent, which we actually can call truly a durable polymer, DES. The elastomeric polymer eliminates crimping and expansion damage, as you can see in the, the electron micrographs. The uniformity and quality of manufacture reduces the chemical and elution degradation. And then all these are after 50 days in plasma. And here you see no cracking, no peeling, uh, no delamination as we did in some of the other prior slides. So in conclusion, our journey through the era of bare metal stenting and the first and second generation drug leading stents has been exciting as we've really done a great job in taking care of patients and improving our efficacy. Despite setbacks along the way, we're now able to treat many complex lesions and complex patients. Our progress in the treatment of coronary artery disease continues to be, however, a challenge because of ongoing efficacy and late safety concerns. Clearly, late catch-up phenomenon and very late synthrombosis needs to be looked at and improved upon. I think the future of coronary intervention rests upon technologies and techniques which will address both restenosis and very late stent thrombosis. The ability to improve upon DES design and impact clinical outcomes is really ultimately the goal of this next generation new Bioneer stent platform. The combination of the novel elastomeric polymer together with the unique quality uniformity in the manufacturing process creates a scenario of a truly durable polymer DES which may offer advantages for patients in the long term. So the question of can we do better? The answer is yes. It is our duty to do so. The question of will we do better? Time will tell. Early data is very promising and I look forward to looking at these in the near future. Thank you very much. So we're going to start with our first question, actually, and I uh, just want to welcome David, who just finished, actually, a, a case with a newly approved uh, drug looting stent. And this question will allude to this is, um, what is the most important factor, either patient presentation, um, disease state, medical history, in selecting one available drug looting stent, but more importantly, one of the newly approved such as linear drug looting stent when you implant the stent. So David, I have my opinion. Uh, what do you think? What should be the the defining factor or to in the selection of the different drug looting stent available? 
Uh, that's a great question, Philippe, and um, thanks for having me as part of the program as well and enjoyed the presentation. I, um, I, I think that, that um, we're at a state today where every stent needs to be evaluated on its own merits. And, and so with that background, though, we're also at a point of parity with regard to clinical uh, outcomes with drug-eluting stents. We're observing the best outcomes we've, we've realized to date uh, as represented both in clinical trials and in clinical practice. And so, um, for the most part, distinctions with regard to rates of stent thrombosis or rates of target lesion revascularization at least aren't as disparate between different types of drug-eluting stents, at least more contemporary drug-eluting stents compared with what we've observed in the past. And so, for me, what really is um, perhaps a greater differentiator of, um, of, of drug-eluting stent selection has to do not so much with the patient complexity uh, with regard to the clinical complexity, for example, advanced renal disease or diabetes, but rather the uh, lesion complexity. Um, for example, uh, issues that might challenge deliverability, issues that might challenge radial strength for a stent, issues that might challenge side branch access for bifurcation disease. And I think here there are, um, are, are still some distinctive uh, differences between drug-eluting stents that exist today in the marketplace with regard to um, some of the performance metrics as well. I think as a, as a last comment on this, as I introduced, we have this level of what might be seen by many clinicians as clinical equivalents among many different types of drug-eluting stents, but I still believe there are differences. It's just that we need to reset our expectations with regard to when and where and how we see differences between drug-eluting stents. And in some instances, it may be on clinical outcomes, and in other instances, it may be in performance metrics between the drug-eluting stents. It may also be even with regard to differences in, in cost uh, and, and affordability as well. I think you what summarized are, What are your, pretty, uh, what yeah, are your thoughts, please? Well, as usual, you, you, you're you right on, and um, I share completely your, your thought. And, I think we're going to learn a lot. There's a new drug uh, in the market right now, and you have the Illinois stent, and you have a lot of experience, surely very deliverable stent. Um, and um, right now, I, I, I truly believe that all these platforms, the second generation DES and the new in the market, are, are just very, very good. Like you say, Excel trial, 0.7 uh, stent thrombosis rate. Now other trials showing 0.4, 0.5% thrombosis rate in very high risk patients. So I think right now it is an equivalent, but in terms of deliverability, you're right. We all have our preferable platform, mainly based on experience sometimes, maybe it's anecdote, but I think some, I mean, you're right. We need to collect more data to identify what lesion subsets will be, uh, will benefit of uh, uh, one or the other stent. Uh, yeah, and, and one, you know, to one, that, one, go, sorry, go ahead, please. Yeah, the one thing I really like to, I mean, I'm, I like you, I'm doing a lot of tabber procedure, and sometimes when I need a, when I occlude a coronary, which is sometimes is, a, is occurring, I find out that when you save the coronary, you need, the, the resolute stent was very good because it's very, very strong um, mm -hmm. to uh, resist the compression of outside material or, or compression, which is very rare. But I think we're going to learn all these niche um, and, you know, we have CTO. We're going to learn what are the best uh, CTO stems. Maybe there's no difference. But uh, I strongly believe that right now we're at the stage where we have, we're lucky, we have very performant platform. Yeah, and you know, just to amplify uh, some of your comments, we've, uh, as, as the leading enrolling center uh, worldwide in the Excel trial with left main disease and, and certainly doing a lot of it at our institution uh, before and since that time, We've actually seen with selected contemporary drug-eluting stents recoil within the left mm -hmm. main of, of, of certain stent brands. And so, um, again, it's these performance metrics and these subtle differences that may be more, more elucidated when, when we have complex disease. The other, the other point that you raised, too, and you, you presented so well with regard to trials like Senior, um, is, is we're, we're actually now embarking on studies worldwide with one month dual antiplatelet therapy with not bioresorbable technologies, but actually permanent polymer uh, drug eluting stents as well. And so across the different types of stents, like you say, we've seen, we're now observing uh, outcomes that are so favorable 
um, that at least in selected patients we can we can abbreviate the dual antiplatelet therapy and um, and 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 I think you know testing that in in selected stents is also important as we move forward um, because again each each stent probably will be held on its individual merits. So so that's that's a nice segue to the the other question from the audience we had, which is. What is the current role, of, if there is any, of bare metal stents? So, uh, one, one, the reason why I, I, I really appreciate the senior trial is it's really showed us now that um, one platform, the Synergy stent, um, compared to bare metal stent, uh, is outperform actually in terms of TLR, and that's or Ristenosis, That's not surprising, but yeah. it's also very, very, very safe. Uh, with short DAP, one month, in selected patient, obviously stable patient, but also with a threefold reduction in stent thrombrosis. So for me, this concept that if you have a patient at risk of bleeding, if you have a patient that needs a surgery in one month, I think right now you don't want to compromise the uh, ischemic uh, or you don't want to have a higher rate of ischemic endpoint because of this false reassurance of the the, the, the lower stent uh, thrombosis with bare metal stent. So um, I think right now, in my humble opinion, bare metal stent should be uh, at best marginalized. It's not eliminated uh, from our practice. Um, I just want to know what do you think uh, about the, the use of bare metal stent in your practice? Do you still have a role for them? I am. Um... Um, and, and again, here in this context, I'm speaking really from personal um, opinion along with my interpretation like yours of the existing data. But um, I drafted an editorial not too long ago uh, entitled Can't Bear It Any Longer. And so I, I, I like you, share your thoughts that I, I don't see a role for bare metal stents in contemporary practice today given um, on the heels of our discussion we've just had, given the uh, the, the exceptional outcomes that that we've observed with contemporary drug eluting stents. And it and it also it underscores also we, we shouldn't forget, and I know you'd agree, uh, the importance of appropriate technique as well. Um, certainly for a patient who's going to have the need for abbreviated dual antiplatelet therapy, and you know, for that matter, I think we could argue for any patient, we want to make sure that we use uh, you know, we have the stent appropriately expanded, whether it's post dilated, whether we use imaging, OCT or IVIS to confirm that that we have appropriate geographic coverage. I mean, we need to, we need to put our best step forward for every patient, and um, it's ever more important for patients who have uh, a, a potential need for shortened dual antiplatelet therapy. The other issue, too, is that, is that the, 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 um, you know, the, 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 the leader's free study, which is a different type of drug-eluting stent, we would all argue, and not one that's probably more routinely used in clinical practice, very different from the senior, uh, the senior trial, but we have the leaders free data again showing the benefits of a drug eluting stent platform compared with a bare metal stent. And then um, we, we can't forget also the Zeus trial. Now the Endeavor stent is no longer available in commercial practice, but it's a drug eluting stent too that if anything had you know slightly higher rates of TLR compared with other drug eluting stents, but it even showed superiority to a bare metal stent with roughly an average of one month dual antiplatelet therapy and not only lower TLR, like you've described in DAP, but also significantly lower stent thrombosis. And, and, um, and, and so altogether, I, I don't see a role for bare metal stents in clinical practice today. I personally don't even know which bare metal stents we stock at our institution. Yeah, no, that's exactly true. One question I have for you is, it seemed it seem that there is a, there's different studies showing short DAP with different stent. Um, um, I have my my opinion about believing that we have retrospective data from Zion stent, from Resolute yes. stent, showing that we can uh, at least do three months of that and maybe uh, one month, knowing that everything occurs when you stop that in the first month. And maybe we can, uh, three months might be enough. Um, so do you believe that all current DES um, could um, have a short DAP, uh, and it's really, I uh, would say, a class effect, uh, and that the, the small, the thin, uh, and the drug release these days are, are so good that we can stop probably everyone in stable fashion with good technique, not too complex disease at three months. What is your thought about that? Is this the device specific? Yeah. If we, if we go 
uh, clinical uh, evidence base. We have senior, we have other um, you know, the, the leaders free. Do you think we should restrict okay. this to this platform, or we have enough retrospective data to support also with other platforms? Um, great, great thought. And and um, just to step back for one quick second on our previous discussion, but again related to this is just with regard to uh, patients, for example, who have a real need, like we're discussing, for uh, a very abbreviated dual antiplatelet therapy duration. For example, patients who have a requirement for upcoming non-cardiac surgery. Um, you know, we're talking about drug eluting versus bare metal stents, and you know, our current guidelines in the United States at least suggest at least three months dual antiplatelet therapy prior to surgery for, excuse me, at least six months, um, at least six months for a drug eluting stent and one month for a bare metal stent. But they don't recommend anything for less than a month. And I think while that's based on the the paucity of evidence or the limitations of the evidence that we have, um, I, again, I, I feel that drug eluting stents are as safe, if not, and of course, more effective than bare metal stents. But if patients really need non cardiac surgery uh, within a month, for example, or within a couple of weeks, I think in those instances, it's not really a discussion about what type of stent, bare metal or drug eluting, uh, or drug eluting. It's probably more of a discussion as should you do the stent procedure at all, or could you try to get the patient through the surgery um, with effective surveillance and medical therapy? So I just wanted to make that quick comment. With regard to, yeah. with regard to, lead to um, is this a class effect with drug eluting stents? Um, you know, part of me, uh, uh, while, while again, I think with the evidence that we've seen with the existing, with the contemporary drug eluting stents that we've observed so far, I, I would feel comfortable with um, with with an abbreviated dual antiplatelet therapy with with most if not all of the contemporary drug eluting stents we have in the U.S. marketplace and and the ones that are are forthcoming um, here over the next year, but at the same time the I guess maybe the clinical trialist of me or the scientific part says that we we really would like to see this with each individual stent type. I think that even with bioresorbable polymer drug eluting stents, this is not a class effect. They differ. Um, variably in their in their not only the type of antiproliferative drug but the elution kinetics and the dissolution times of the bioresorbable polymers that in a in a way each needs to be held to their own standard. Now whether that necessarily requires a prospective randomized trial, I don't think that's the case, especially for stents that we have already a fair amount of evidence uh, with with interruption or with with um, a, abbreviated dual antiplatelet therapy, but um, I think uh, one limitation of all the registry data that we have with Zions and with Resolute, for example, to date, um, is that is that those data weren't exactly collected in the same way we would do it in a prospective fashion. Absolutely. Um, I want to finish with maybe two a brief question. Um, you, uh, you know, present so well the data at TCT, um, um, on actually at ACC on Inulear uh, drug eluting stand, which is a newly approved uh, platform from Cardinal Health uh, Pyramidinol. Uh, you use a lot of them. Actually, you probably just used them like five minutes ago. But okay. what is, what is your um, what is your your thought about the need for new uh, drug looting stands such as Inulear, knowing that the results were spectacular in all comers, actually more comers population of SVG CTOs with extremely low rate of thrombose, never seen before in such population. So why do you care yeah. about this new platform? So uh, I think that um, the introduction of Elunir into the U.S. marketplace is welcome for several reasons. Um, number one, I think this is a, a great opportunity now to have um, yet again, another company, and in this case with history in the drug eluting stent space, um, marketing a drug eluting stent in the United States compared with for several years we've had um, a relative you know paucity of new of newcomers into this space. So that that certainly is always welcomed with innovation and new opportunity for study. The second um, issue is that uh, as a little bit um, echoing the, our earlier discussion is that, I think there are opportunities for us to um, to learn more about distinctions from across different drug eluting stents. And in this regard, um, this is a, a drug eluting stent that has, uh, uh, I think, some very thoughtful science behind it with regard to the construction of the stent, but also the construction of the stent delivery system. And uh, one of the most renowned interventional cardiologists um, told me at TCT that he 
he felt his experience in, in Europe was that this was one of the most deliverable stents that he's ever used in clinical practice, which is a, a real statement. And and then the other part about the Elunir stent is that, uh, just as you introduced, I think that the clinical trials program for this was really commendable in the sense that the very first patients that were put into the Elunir, in Elunir the bionic study with the Elunir stent were were really the first humans treated with this stent technology. So there wasn't this traditional historical process of a first in human study of 20 people and then a 200 patient study as a phase two study, but really the, the first patients that were treated with the stent were also the first patients that were, along with a trial called Nereus, contributing to the pivotal studies that led to this approval. And we did it in, um, as you described, the so-called more term, we, we term this a more commerce patient population. It was a patient population that included those requiring atherectomy, chronic total occlusions, bifurcation lesions, uh, saphenous vein graft disease, recent and myocardial infarction. So it was a much more complex patient population than more traditional historical pivotal clinical trials. And I think that is only, you know, it, that's a, a leap forward in terms of um, advancing our knowledge of the performance of this stent in, in, in patients that are more representative of, clinic, of clinical practice rather than a more selective, um, less complex uh, patients and more simple lesions as well. Well, uh, David, as usual, always a pleasure to have your thoughtful comments and uh, thanks for joining us. Well, as well. The, thank you, Philippe. And uh, at this point, we would like to thank all our listeners for attending actually today's webinar. To be uh, just uh, some housekeeping, to be eligible for uh, CEC credits for today's activity, log on on the website, www.naccme.com, uh, and successfully complete the 10 question post test and evaluation form, and uh, immediately print your documentation of credit. Um, so that concludes this session. Thanks you again for joining us.